Welcome to First. I'm Mark Eichmann along with Shirley Min and Nichelle Polston. Delaware's chemical report card says a lot about the balance between the environment and the economy. We'll share some of the findings this week. Wilmington's mayor shares some of his thoughts about crime, the economy, and other issues he's facing going into his third month on the job. And we meet a group of women who share their stories that made them the first women in their fields. We'll explain. First, your public media news magazine starts now. For years, Delaware was known as the chemical capital of America, and while the number of chemical firms in the state has declined in favor of credit card companies and banks, the state still has a high number of chemical producers for its small size. This week's first look explores what those companies and others are releasing into Delaware's environment. It started more than 200 years ago with the granddaddy of all chemical companies in Delaware, DuPont, which brought the world the wonderful world of chemistry as seen in this 1964 production from the New York World's Fair. Everything in the world, you know, is made up of molecules, and some of the most useful are those that form versatile plastics, like Alethon, Delrin, Lucite, Teflon. Here's what we mean. But the production of those wonderful chemicals, of course, almost always results in undesirable byproducts, sometimes toxic emissions into the air, water, and ground. Since 1987, the state has published a complete report on those emissions called the Toxics Release Inventory. The Toxics Release Inventory falls under the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act, and it was really done to allow the public to understand what is in their community. As director of the State Division of Waste and Hazardous Substances, Marjorie Crofts keeps track of releases from facilities throughout Delaware. In 2015, releases to the air in Delaware dropped by 12 percent. But releases to water were up 32 percent, and releases to land were up 62 percent. By far, the biggest source of releases is the Delaware City Refinery, next to the Delaware River. The refinery was responsible for 73 percent of all releases in the state. And while the refinery has reduced its air emissions of sulfuric acid by 73,000 pounds, it increased emissions of nitrate compound to the Delaware River by 622,000 pounds. Getting it to a nitrate-based is much better than sending ammonia into the river. And so they've done a good, in that they've had increases means they're, they're decreasing their ammonia, which is a good thing. In a big water body like they put it into the Delaware River, the amount of nitrates, again, gets diluted. 90% of releases to water in Delaware go into the Delaware River, with those nitrate compounds making up the bulk at more than 3.7 million pounds. The 2015 report also shows a decrease in air releases for the state overall, mainly from the shutdown of Camor's Edgemore facility on the Delaware River. The decrease is better for health and the environment, but not for the 200 workers who used to work there. you got to balance that with the economy. And, you know, if you really see this go to zero, it's because we've lost the jobs in those areas. Uh, there is a certain amount of pollution that is going to be generated with any manufacturing company. It it's really comes down to how much can our water and air tolerate before it starts having negative impacts on public health. And while there have been improvements, Delaware still ranks sixth in the nation for most pounds released per square mile. Delaware has a higher concentration than maybe some of the much larger states with a lot larger open area than we do. But it, that said, we've also been able to reduce a lot of those and work with the companies to make that happen. You can find the complete Toxics Release Inventory Report online at denrec.delaware.gov. You can search by facility or by chemical to see what's being released in your area. And while Denrec continues its missions, there's been a delay in getting Governor John Carney's nominee to lead the environmental agency approved. David Small is continuing to lead Denrec, even though Carney nominated former EPA Administrator Sean Garvin to the post. Here to dig into some of that backstory is Republican State Senator Greg Lavelle. Welcome to First. Thanks for being here. Happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, so, so what's the issue with Garvin? What's the holdup here? So, you know, we have a responsibility as, in the Senate, and our role is to sort of vet and communicate and discuss with all the nominees for all cabinet secretaries or boards, commissions, and all those types of things, because we do vote on them. And the, the issue that came up with Mr. Garvin is that we had a sort of a discussion with him in our caucus, 
and a lot of our members uh, didn't feel he was uh, prepared to take on the job uh, in answering questions specifically that he was either evasive, didn't know the answer, or maybe a combination of both, and it, it left uh, the, our caucus unsettled about his tenure at DENREC. DENREC's an extremely important uh, division, you know, on the environmental side, which you were just talking about, on the park side, it has a broad swath, tremendous regulatory power, uh, and so there, there was discomfort with him, and then the governor ultimately chose not to put him forward. Uh, somewhat rare, probably very rare for a, a cabinet secretary to sort of be held up, held up in this way and not put forward for a vote. Is there one specific issue, a uh, concern with, with Garvin that, that your caucus is not? It, it, it is out of being unprepared or apparently unprepared. Okay. Uh, again, not answering questions, not getting back to us on very specific questions on everything from Bloom to energy prices. I had questions about the sustainable energy utility and conflicts of interest uh, and a variety of other questions. So it, there's not one thing other than, I guess, to sum it up and say he wasn't answering our questions. And you said you haven't heard from, from Garvin since then. What, what then is the, ne is the next step for this? Do you see him coming up for a vote when you re re that, That's ultimately up to the governor. So we go back uh, second week of March and uh, we'll see what they want to do then. Um, it's, it's their decision. Uh, we, we, when Mr. Garvin had his executive committee hearing, we were asked not to ask him a lot of questions. They, they told us they were not going to put him up for a vote, so we held a lot of those questions back. So if they do decide to go forward with them, which is their right, and it's our right to vote yes and no, uh, we'll ask those questions again. All right, we'll, we'll keep watching. State Senator Greg Lavelle, appreciate your time. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Wilmington Mayor Mike Perzicki has been on the job a little under two months, so we thought we'd check in with him as our first person this week. Mayor, thanks so much for being here. Good to be here. Um, you're about a month away from presenting <coughs> your budget. How, how is that process going along? It's just a, a much more involved process than anybody would imagine, and you, and you really have so little time mm -hmm. to prepare because for the first month, and I don't think it's a month, it's about a month and a half now, it, uh, for the first month, you're just trying to get your sea legs. You know, mm -hmm. it's, <clears throat> there's so much to know. There's so, mu so many details of governance that you're, not, you're certainly not acquainted with until you're in there. And all of a sudden, now you've got to start preparing a budget. And I, I look at the budget as, as an extremely important document because it really it creates the priorities for the government as well. And I think it's a, it's a shame if you don't take full advantage of the time to lay out what is a philosophical mm -hmm. as well as financial roadmap for the city. You had the no workman's compensation surprise. Any other surprises yeah. that you've hit? Uh, along the way? Well, I think, the, I think the surprises that you run into are the, uh, a lot of the details of contracts, the, kind, mm -hmm. the kinds of things that constrain management from trying to run the government. Uh, and that's not to say that they're not, it's not a value judgment, it's trying to get an understanding of what you can do and what you can't do and what I think, uh, uh, what labor does right and what they, in my opinion, uh, what that does wrong, and so we have to we have to constantly, you know, kind of reacquaint ourselves with a lot of these uh, issues that, on the campaign trail, you just never come in touch with. Right, the uh, issue of violence obviously continues to be a problem in the city. We had the double homicide this week. Right. Um, anything new to speak of on the policing front with what's going on with the joint operation? Well, that's been that's been very helpful on two fronts. Number one, it has helped to have. Uh, additional officers out on the street. Additional police presence is always important. But two, and I think probably more important, is that the public has been has been heartened by the idea that our governments can all work together with common purpose mm -hmm. without any political infighting. You know, my sense is that this effort by our state police and our county police working with our, our uh, Wilmington Police Department has been more heartening because of the sense of cooperation that it mm -hmm. has for the efficacy of the effort, which, by the way, I think is generally has been very good. Sometimes I think when there's new leadership in place, there's this renewed hope of, okay, well, things might get better from here. And then, you know, <clears throat> yeah. you're into your term, and we've had uh, shooting after shooting, and, and the crime yeah. still continues to be a problem. I could see how maybe the public might get discouraged. I don't think they're going to get discouraged for, f let me say it this another way. I don't think that six weeks into anybody's term, people start to say, well, he's no better than the other guy. Mm -hmm. Because what everybody seems to understand is this is a long-term uh, proposition to turn 
this violence around. Mm -hmm. You have to understand how deeply seated uh, in some of our communities that this kind of propensity for violence is. It's not something you can just, you can give a talk and change everybody's minds. I mean, these are, uh, these are, these, these are deeply troubling matters that will take a lot of time to turn around. But I believe public, the public's gonna give us time. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, at some point you own it. And mm -hmm. at some point, if you've not done your job, then I think you've got to take responsibility for it. But for right, for right now, I don't think anybody is particularly disheartened by the, the acts of violence we've seen this month. As troubling as it is on an individual basis, I don't think anybody is looking at this and saying, oh, well, this administration can't handle it. Right. Well, what's going on with the nationwide search for the police chief? Is that still we're, ongoing? Uh, we're ongoing, yep. We have, uh, we have interviews coming up soon. Uh, we're interviewing... We've got applicants locally. The chief has already indicated that he is competing and he mm -hmm. intends to compete hard for this job. So we've got, uh, we've got professional uh, advice that uh, we're taking advantage of. And uh, you know, we're, gonna make, we're gonna make a decision that's best for our department wherever we go. But I, I feel pretty good about the way this, is, this whole exercise is going forward. Do you know when you might name someone? You know, I would certainly guess within 30 days, but okay. uh, yeah, no, it'll be fairly, I mean, we're, we're well into the process now. So your office got word earlier this month about Hal Real's group World Cafe Live leaving the Queen Theater at the mm -hmm. end of May. Yeah. You know, was that sort of a, a hit in the gut or? No, not at all. You saw well, it not at all because I, I know they have, they have a, a plan B mm -hmm. right behind it. So, you know, we, I've discussed it with the, uh, the people up at Light Up the Queen and uh, and to be clear, the management. Queen isn't closing. No, the Queen's fine. And, the, you know, I think all that's happened is that just the management of the, of the, uh, the entertainment and the acts just uh, wasn't satisfactory. And for whatever reason, they decided to go their separate ways. And then, but I know there is, they've got a real good, strong backup. So uh, that's going to be going on. Did you take it personally when Hal Real said the revitalization on market just wasn't happening <laughs> as well, quickly as he had hoped? I, I certainly didn't take it personally at all. I mean... You know, I got here about 10 minutes ago, so no, I, that doesn't bother me. But I think that, I think that that is grossly unfair mm -hmm. because I think the revitalization has been remarkable. And I think I, I like to look back. I like to point people to the riverfront uh, in that for years we had, you know, we had so much going on and yet there was something missing. Everybody always said there's something that's still missing. And as soon as we got people living down there, this, that something missing disappeared. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden it became... You know, overnight it seemed to change, and I think that's what's going to happen down here. We've got more and more people moving in down here, and you're going to see that is what's going to electrify uh, Market Street. Okay, we are out of time. Wilmington Mayor Mike Przicki, thank you so much for being here as our first person this week, and uh, we will definitely be seeing you again soon. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Thanks, Shirley. Coming up on First, his work started as an idea for a Christmas gift from his wife. Now that artistry that comes out of his lathe can be seen all over the region. It's our first experience. And then the story of three women who were firsts in their field. On Tuesday, President Trump will address a joint session of Congress. We'll carry that address live on WHYY TV at 9 p.m. It's a good reason to bring in Senator Tom Carper to talk about the administration and whatever else we can fit into five and a half minutes. Hi, Senator. Let's talk fast. Okay, we have to talk <laughs> fast. All right. <laughs> well, uh, the president has only been in office for a few, actually, over a little over a month. It seems longer. It does. It does. Yeah, Can you give us a grade for him? Would you grade yeah, him? I'd say incomplete. We'll be, <laughs> I'll be generous. Incomplete. I mean, In uh, the, uh, there's not a lot you can do as a, as a new uh, president coming in in the first month. And uh, he's uh, certainly stirred things up. And we gotten, I've, uh, we've gotten more phone calls, emails, faxes, and so forth, text messages in my office, five times more than we would in any other comparable period in the time that I've been in the U.S. Senate. I've never seen people being so involved and so uh, uh, talkative yeah. about, uh, about the, the start of the new administration. So you, this, isn't, this isn't the first time you've been 
uh, in office under a Republican uh, now, George president. W. Bush, you yes. know, eight years, he and I were governors together. Mm -hmm. And then Barack and I served together, Joe Biden, you know, and we were good friends for many years. What's different this time having another Republican president? Well, George W. Bush, is, we were governors together for six years. A lot of the people that he uh, nominated served on his, on his uh, cabinet. Christy Whitman, former governor of uh, New Jersey. Yes. Uh, Tommy Thompson, former governor of Wisconsin. The, uh, uh, Tom Ridge, Secretary of Homeland Security. I mean, like, we know these people. Yeah. And they had served, uh, served in public office. They've been vetted. And uh, this, uh, this uh, team, if you add up their, their wealth of this, uh, this cabinet, the, I'm told that uh, put all their net worth together, it's as much as a third of the entire population of the country. And when uh, so that naturally invites a lot of uh, potential conflicts of interest. We didn't have to worry about that stuff with your, George W. Bush's uh, folks. They've been vetted. They're public officials for the most part. Okay. And, uh, and we knew them. They were a known quantity. All right. Well, you just became the ranking Democrat on the Environment and Public Works Committee. Uh, thoughts on Scott Pruitt's appointment? Uh, when uh, Donald Trump was candidate Trump last year, when yeah. he was uh, president-elect Trump last year, when he was uh, sworn into office uh, as a new president uh, last month, he said that uh, one of the things he wanted to do was degrade and destroy the Environmental Protection Agency, which is involved in clean air, clean water, chemicals, uh, chemical safety, um, uh, and th that, that kind of thing. And uh, he, uh, you wonder if he says a lot of things he doesn't mean, and we find out later on he changes his mind. So that's, people can change their mind. But uh, we f figured out that he was telling the truth when uh, he uh, nominated Scott Pruitt, former Attorney General of um, Oklahoma, uh, who spent the last six years as Attorney General raising money from fossil fuel companies, coal companies, uh, petroleum companies, uh, gas companies, utilities, uh, in order to attack the EPA. Uh, some of like 16, 17, 18 suits against the EPA, stuff that we care about, including mercury poisoning in our air, lead in our water, uh, the, uh, the blowing of uh, um, pollutants uh, put up in the Midwest, they blow over on us yeah. on the East Coast, sea level rise and all that stuff. He's been involved in lawsuits around the other side of Delaware in, in, these, in these issues. Is it safe to say that's someone that you're not a fan of? Not, not a big fan of. I'm sure he's a perfectly good father, husband, mm -hmm. um, maybe a very good lawyer. But to, to nominate somebody with his, uh, his record of really attacking uh, cleaner air, clean water provisions and uh, cross-border pollution, sea level rise, I, I would hope the person that would uh, be running the Environmental Protection Agency would actually have a record of being a, uh, someone who has a steward of the environment and yeah, uh, says in the course. scripture that we should be basically take care of this planet on which we uh, have been given. Okay, well, do you believe the stories of Russian hacking to influence the presidential election? Uh, the, uh, what we've been told by, I think, about 17 uh, uh, intelligence agencies, including FBI, CIA, and others, is that the Russians uh, were doing hack they were doing illegal hacking. They were finding out information about uh, from Hillary, Hillary's uh, campaign uh, committee, apparently finding out some of the stuff from the Republican from Trump's cam campaign committee. They put Hillary's stuff up on uh, the internet mm -hmm. and, uh, and did not uh, do that with the, uh, the information from the Trump campaign, the, the Republicans. So people uh, could, uh, could judge, well, we got this bad stuff on Hillary. There's nothing in here for, for uh, Mr. Trump. And I think it very much uh, affected the, the outcome of the election. Okay, so I'll tell you this. I don't have a hat for you, but I'm going to have you put on a, an invisible mm. hat for, yeah. for a second. Uh, your, actually, your former governor hat. Uh, tell me, what do you think of John Carney's budget reset meetings? Are they good to have at this point? I, th I think when you lo look at, uh, I, was, I was fortunate to be governor for eight years, yeah. uh, 93 to 2001. I really when I became governor, we were in a recession, and we just came out of it and had uh, eight uh, terrific years in the, in the end. John takes office at the, with a big hole in the, in the budget, a mm -hmm. $300 million hole to fill. And I think what uh, my advice to him, uh, I, I love John, I think he'll be a great governor, he's a great congressman, he's a member of my cabinet when I was governor. Yeah. But I think if I err in his shoes, what I would do is look at everything that we're doing in, in, in the state, everything from A, from a to Z, and ask this question, can we get a better result for less money, or a better result uh, for the same amount of money? And to, to look at the revenues, make sure people that owe taxes are actually paying the taxes that are owed. Yeah. And if we have to look for some new revenues, it's gotta be a combination of uh, spending constraint and a, a combination of some, some additional revenues. Well, since you're in a mood of giving advice, what about uh, the sluggish economy? What would you advise them to do? People say it's a sluggish economy. The, uh, 
Uh, compared to what? Compared to what happened during, on the administration of George W. Bush? I don't think so. Well, we'll leave the, it on uh, that note. So yeah. there, uh, but can we do better? Sure, we can do better. And we especially need to do better for folks who used to have good paying jobs, a lot of manufacturing jobs. They don't have those jobs anymore. They don't have the skills that are needed in the workforce today. We need to help make sure they get the skills so that they can go to work tomorrow and make a good living for themselves and their families. Always a pleasure to have you Thanks here to you. on Thanks. set. Thank you so much, Senator Thank Tom you. Carper of Delaware. John Steyer worked in the insurance business. After he retired, he turned his attention to wood turning. He makes bowls, vases, pens, and much more. And John's journey from hobby to business all started with a Christmas list. It's quite a first experience to see John's work. I'm substantially retired from an insurance company, and as I was gearing down from the insurance business, I started wood turning. My wife and I decided to make a list of what we would like for Christmas. So I would make a list and put a lathe on the list. Never got the lathe. So one year I decided, you know, there's really nothing that I want or need. I'll just put lathe and nothing else. Well, she only had that one option. <laughs> so, so she got me a, an inexpensive lathe, and I used it for the better part of 20 years. My first thought was, where am I going to get wood? My wife addressed that, that circumstance at the same Christmas she got the lathe. She got a box full of wood for my father, who at that time still lived on a farm up in Pennsylvania. But of course, since then, uh, it has dawned on me, wood does grow on trees, and we are surrounded by them. And so now I've got 10 lifetimes worth of wood laying around. I like to turn things that are attractive and people appreciate pepper mills, pens, bowls, vases. The popular wood that I use for pens is poison ivy. When I turn it, I'm turning the heart wood and not the sap wood. That's poison free and makes a nice looking pen. And far fewer poison ivy pens are stolen. It probably takes me longer now to make a pen than it did 10 or 20 years ago because it can always be a little smoother. The lines could be a little more crisp. It could be uh, polished a little bit better. I think it's a mindset that you're probably born with. Maybe you're surrounded with it as you're growing up and you're, you're drawn to certain aspects of, of art. Wood turning is, is fun for me. It's not for everybody. A finely turned piece of wood is something that, that you bought it because you like the way it looks, the way it feels, or the memories that, that it evokes. It's a cherished possession. You're going to put someplace where you can enjoy it and others can see it and you'll talk about it. I want something that is not only round, but perfectly shaped and smooth and polished. So then in my own mind, if it's finished, then I'm happy. John can be found at art and craft shows all over Delaware and Maryland. For more information on upcoming shows and his work, go to lathe-meister.com. WHYY and Philly.com are collaborating on a project called Black Joy. It celebrates various people during February, which is Black History Month. This week on First, we're highlighting three women who recently made local history right here in the first state. Some are familiar faces and others may be names you'll recognize in the future. My motto has always been dream big and make it happen. It's really great to be first at something. It creates a sense of um, personal accomplishment 
and, uh, and pride in accomplishing. But more important than being first is, is what happens while you're there and what you really create for after you leave. Um, and so for me, with having uh, completed the University of Delaware, first African-American woman to graduate in engineering, more important for me with regard to that is that now there have been a few thousand African-American women who've gotten their degree in engineering. And for as, as fulfilling as it was to serve as the state treasurer. And so now here as city treasurer, it's great to be the first woman and African-American to serve in this role. But what's more important for me is now what am I going to do with that? I have the responsibility to, um, to do a great job in that role and to create a pathway for anyone else who wants to come behind and serve. Every day when certain things happen or um, you know, I, a, a person addresses me a certain type of way or I am able to make a decision that I haven't been used to making as a council member for the past 12 years, I realize that, wow, this is it. I really am <laughs> a president of city council and understanding in my femininity, you know, first woman president. So it's really a great feel feeling to be that role model for our young girls to see that you too can, you know, dreams can come true and you can be whatever you want. I think that the, the success of my tenure as a public servant um, is because I stopped and listened. Everyone along the way as we were getting closer and after we won the primary and even after we won the general election, people would ask me, what, what does it feel like to make history? And that really was a tough question for me to answer. Um, and I said at the time, it didn't feel like something special. It felt like we were doing the work and this was the result of so many people coming together and really making this a reality. But the day that I was sworn in, the day that I stood in that house chamber and raised my hand and took the oath, that moment is when it really sunk in that we had done something really incredible and really special especially for Delaware, um, you know, having never elected a woman in our state and having never elected a person of color, um, it, it just all of a sudden became very real um, and, and, and really just reminded me of everyone that came before me. Throughout the course of this year, find somebody new that you've never heard about, like a Hattie Phelan, you know, and, and, and learn about them. Find out about somebody new. That, that's one of the challenges that I put forth to, to, to folks is find out about somebody new and also bring somebody else along on that journey. Hattie Phelan, who Congresswoman Blunt Rochester mentioned, was the first African-American woman to serve on city council in Wilmington. I also like to mention Senator Margaret Rose Henry is another first among us. Congresswoman Blunt Rochester said it best, try to learn about someone new for black history and take a friend on that journey. And next week on First, we'll put the 10th Senatorial District special election in perspective. It's a mouthful. Don't forget, though, you can see videos Sunday morning on newsworks.org and then hear a recap of results during Weekend Edition on WHYY FM 90.9. And that is First for this week. We thank you for watching. For Nichelle Polston and Shirley Min, I'm Mark Eichmann. Have a great week.